Hi everyone, let me welcome you on behalf of Harvard College Effective Altruism, a student group representing a fast-growing social movement of effective altruism. Effective altruism is the idea of a two-step process. First, figure out how to do the most good, using reason, evidence, and a scientific mindset. Second, actually do it. If you want to help us with changing the world, uh, please check our website and sign up for our mailing list to stay tuned about the best ways of getting involved. Uh, so, now that you're solved, solved for effective altruism, uh, please welcome Steven Pinker, who will introduce tonight's guest. Thank you, Alice, and uh, welcome, everyone. I became interested in the work that you're going to hear about from Max Roser uh, this evening when I, uh, through a long chain of coincidences, blundered into writing a book on the history and psychology of violence, uh, which led me to um, look for any data set that I could find that actually try, tried to quantify violence and plot it over time. And uh, I found, first to my surprise, and to the even greater surprise of people who read my book, that most of the curves kind of look like that. They go down. Uh, something that you would not guess from reading the newspapers. Uh, but as a cognitive psychologist, I came to realize that uh, the newspapers are a uh, very poor way of understanding what's happening in the world, thanks to a quirk of our psychology that cognitive psychologists call the availability heuristic. Namely, when we're called on to judge probability or risk, we do so by the cognitive shortcut of trying to uh, recall examples from memory, and the more available the examples, the higher the probability we subjectively assign to a category of event. So if you read uh, in the morning paper about a shark attack, then uh, you won't go into the water. You suddenly think that sharks are a grave danger. Uh, <clears throat> whereas you might get into your car and you know, text, start texting while driving, which statistically is far more likely to kill you than getting eaten by a shark. But because you seldom read a... Um, newspaper headline about someone who gets killed uh, texting while driving, your subjective estimate of that probability doesn't match the, the uh, actual fact. Uh, so the uh, disconnect between our uh, psychology, fed by a news media that runs by the slogan, if it bleeds, it leads, uh, and our uh, cognitive psychology le leads to a uh, situation in which most of us really have no idea uh, what the world is like or which way it's going. Uh, I, when I made the argument in um, my book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, that uh, uh, most people's impressions are out of whack with, uh, with reality, uh, I slipped in, uh, in the very first paragraph, um, a kind of uh, awakening statement that I'm, this book is going to be about the most uh, important thing that has ever happened in human history, namely the uh, decline of violence. And the first reviewer in The Guardian, in a largely favorable review, said uh, there's one statement, though, that is totally wrong, and that is that there are other uh, aspects of human well-being that uh, have uh, been just as dramatic and have affected far more people. Uh, and in fact, that violence for all the uh, attention that it gets is just one dimension of uh, human well-being, and that revolutions such as uh, economic growth and public health probably affect more people. Well, that led me to expand my interest to other ways of uh, quantifying our, uh, our, our condition, other ways of shaking us out of our availability uh, bias to get a more accurate uh, assessment of where the world is and which way it's going, and uh, I came across the work of, uh, of Max Roser. Uh, Max, I'm not going to give away his story. He has a mind-boggling website called Our World in Data, which he will uh, tell us about this evening. But after we met at Oxford, we've uh, had a very um, productive and uh, uh, enjoyable correspondence. Um, and it is, uh, I think that uh, I'm very excited about the work that Max does. Uh, I think he is at the forefront of uh, at least three revolutions in uh, our species' understanding of itself. One is the uh, data revolution, just the fact that um, if you don't want to be a victim of the availability uh, illusion, then uh, it, nothing but uh, data will um, give you an accurate picture uh, of, of the world. Anytime you use the word more or less or better or worse, you are making a quantitative claim. And if you 
don't have data to refer to, uh, you are talking through your hat, and no one should take you seriously. And for the first time in human history, we're starting to have that data. Max is at the forefront of bringing data to bear on questions that everyone opines about, but that uh, no one has any basis for doing so. Uh, second, Max is at the forefront of a revolution in communication that, uh, as much as I love language, and there's no one who loves language, uh, I, I suspect, more than I do. I write about it. I study it. But uh, language is kind of overrated when it comes to certain kinds of human communication, and there are certain facts and ideas about the world that are best conveyed by other media, in particular uh, various graphic displays that go well beyond the, the pie chart and bar graph that, uh, that we learned in high school. Max is at the uh, cutting edge of the uh, revolution in uh, data presentation. And third, uh, as a result of these two efforts, uh, Max is um, uh, among the people who I think is going to be changing our view of, uh, in general, of how the world is doing, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, uh, how we could do more of the right things and less of the wrong things. And again, I won't say anything more because that's, uh, that's Max's story. Just a few words of introduction before I uh, 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 stop talking and allow you to hear the uh, uh, exciting uh, work that Max has done. Max is uh, trained as an economist. Uh, he, his research interests are growth and distribution of living standards. Uh, he is uh, born in Germany, but did most of his higher education at the University of Innsbruck in Austria, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Geoscience, uh, a BA and an MA in Philosophy, a Master's in Economics, and a Doctorate in Economics. Uh, he is currently at the Institute of New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin School. Uh, Max also consults with the uh, World Bank and the Global Fund. So without further ado, uh, Max Roser. Shy. Does that work, this microphone? Uh, I think so, right? Um, let me just go full screen here. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to the Effective Altruism Group. Um, we just sat down for, I guess, an hour, or like we lost, lost track of time. Um, and it was a really a fun discussion, so I can just encourage everyone to, to join if you haven't done so. Um, and thank you very much for the introduction, Professor Pinker. Um, it's, it's great to, to be here and, and give this talk about um, the work that I've been doing for the, for the last couple of years. And as um, Stephen Pinker was saying, it's um, like most of what I'm showing tonight is uh, research that is presented on this um, website that you see here in the big letters, ourworldindata.org. And what I'm trying to do there is to bring out the empirical research that we have about how the world is changing, about changing living standards over the long run, and um, take it out of journals um, that maybe only um, a few specialists know about, and uh, take the data and visualize it so that um, we all that we care about how the world is doing and whether um, the efforts that we're putting in uh, to make to make it a better world are actually fruitful or not. Um, and I guess these are questions that everyone asks, like whether you're at some conference or at Harvard or whether you're just sitting around and uh, drinking a beer. These are the kind of questions that you care about. What happens to poverty? What happens to malnutrition? And I'm trying to... Um, bridge the gap between these guys that actually have the answers to these kind of questions and um, people who are not um, reading every um, latest issue of, of every um, uh, famine research paper, for, uh, to give an example. So that's kind of the big, bigger idea. And then for, um, um, for like the reasons that um, Stephen Pinker was mentioning, um, one big aspect of why I'm doing this, and I want to start quickly with, um, with giving an overview of, of, of this reason, is that I think um, if we don't have this um, empirical knowledge at our hands, and if we don't study it, and if we don't have access to it, then it's, it's very easy to be wrong about that. Just to give you a couple of examples, um, this is um, a scatter plot that looks at the misperception of the size of the foreign-born population. On the x-axis, you see the actual share of immigrants, and if 
everyone would estimate the number of immigrants or the share of immigrants correctly, then you would expect that all of the values um, would lie along this um, 45 degree line. But if you actually plot the estimated share of immigrants um, that you find in, in surveys against it, then you see that in every country, um, the share of the foreign-born population is vastly overestimated. I think uh, for the US, for example, the share is between like, maybe 13% or so, and there are two surveys reported here, and people apparently think that 27, 28% of the US population are foreign-born. Um, and I guess these things, they matter for the kind of um, policies, for example, that, uh, that you vote for. Like I, um, I'll, I'll see what um, Donald Trump is, is up to from a distance, and I'm <laughs> happy that I'm not part of that. Uh, to give another example, this is um, what, uh, the question where people were asked what share of the world's one-year-old children is vaccinated against, vaccinated against measles is from the Gap Mine Foundation, Hans Rosling, and the correct answer, 80%, um, is, is only known by 70% of the people surveyed here. Another example question was, in the last 20 years, the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has, and the answers, possible answers were almost doubled, remained more or less the same, and 66, two-thirds um, think that the world population living in absolute poverty has doubled, whereas the correct answer is only known by 5%. Another example, and that is actually my, my, my core um, research topic, I'm, I'm an economist looking at uh, the distribution of incomes over the long run and distributions of wealth, so this is an example um, from this research, not my own research though. As, um, qu people were asked what they, would, uh, what they want the wealth inequality, wealth distribution in the US to look like, and this is what people um, reported as their um, ideal. Um, or acceptable um, wealth inequality, top 20% would get like more than 30%. And then if you ask them what they think the um, wealth distribution looks like, they un understand that it's not ideal and that a larger share of the top 20, like a larger share is owned by the um, richest 20%, but the reality of it actually looks like that. Another example for this um, large misperception um, and I guess the last example, it's the ugliest graph of the, um, of the presentation, I promise. Um, but um, it's, it's taken by some journalists. Um, um, and it's looking at the topic that um, Stephen Pinker was mentioning before. This is uh, survey data where, most, uh, where people were asked whether violence goes up and down. And um, um, while violence was falling for the most of the last two decades, um, the brown line shows that um, the Americans um, mostly think that, America, uh, that violence is going up every year, so exactly the opposite of what is true. So for these reasons, I'm, I'm, I'm putting together this website that makes the data available. And um, I guess to not just like show the website, but to actually um, give some, to, get, to present some story, I, put, put, um, I picked one um, aspect, and that is um, the growth of incomes and um, the change of poverty over time, because I think, I think it is really the one most important thing that happened in, in modern history. Even if the, your first paragraph uh, is mentioning uh, violence there, I would, I would, I would um, put my hand down for economic growth. So I want to give a long-term perspective on, on, on economic growth and, and show how um, prosperity and poverty um, are changing around the world. Um, as an introduction, this is, like, if, you're an, if you're a social scientist, then you know that the, that the, the, the most difficult thing about uh, social science is that all of these trends, whether it's um, um, violence or income or health, they're all closely interlinked. So if you want to give some um, perspective on what's happening to, li to living standards, it's kind of hard to, under, to, to, to have like a natural um, starting point for what is happening, because the one um, change increasing um, health is the, is the cause, cause uh, um, and the driver of the other um, change, for example, increasing um, um, incomes. So um, I want to give a perspective on the very long run on living conditions, and I guess a good starting point is health, because it is something that, is, that you can easily compare over time, much easier than um, incomes, as we will see. Here, 
you're looking at the life expectancy in the UK, the country where I'm currently living, and you see that from 1540s, this is where the first data is available, um, to 1800, there's just no trend in this, um, in, um, in what's happening to health in the UK, and life expectancy is very low. It's mostly just below 40 years. This is, of course, um, due to um, high mortality at a young age, and we will look at this later, um, but life was, was, um, was much shorter. And if you look at the, the world in 1800, then uh, these are estimates in the current borders of the world for the life expectancy back then. And you see in these dark red colors that um, these very dark red colors show life expectancy in the low 20s, and the and slightly better off countries have life expectancy in, this, in the 30s, like the UK that we just saw. Um, but no country in the world back then had a life expectancy of higher than 40 years. And then what happens is um, after 1800, um, life expectancy um, more than double is now higher than 80 years. And um, a little bit later, my home country, Germany, is picking up. And um, yet later, from a lower level also, a country like India is, um, is increasing the life expectancy. And if you want to see that for all the world regions, then it looks like this. Um, countries like Europe and Oceania and the, um, the Americas increased their life expectancy in the late 19th century, and then um, Asia and Africa are following later in the early 20th century. And the global average, um, shown in this blue line, is showing that the um, life expectancy actually doubled over the course of the 20th century and is now um, at 70 years. And these um, graphs that have a long flat line and then this pickup at the end, you find them everywhere. This is data that shows you the heights of men over two millennia. Um, and the reason why researchers are interested in the heights um, is because it is a very good proxy for the food provision and also the health situation of the population. Um, and you see that for the longest time there was no trend there. This is some um, like there are economic historians that go around and um, look at the graves and tombs of, um, of people from the time and measure. I think mostly they're looking at the length of the, how do you call it, femur? Mm -hmm. femur um, and reconstruct the um, height of these people. And uh, for the longest time there was no trend. Um, 170 centimeters um, was the average height there. And then at the um, 19th century it picks up and um, um, it is increasing, and that is actually a trend that you see in all um, societies now that um, height is Im improving and um, closely um, proxies health provision, uh, food provision. That's why I'm showing it here as a measure for food provision over the last two two millennia. Uh, food provision brings us to yields. This is showing you um, the wheat production in in France. In green, you see the uh, area that was used for wheat production. And in orange, you see the pro actual production of wheat. And until the 19th century, there's this close match, and the increase in food production is actually due to using uh, a larger area um, for, for the production of the food. And then at some point, you have this decoupling where production goes up, and um, the area actually um, stays stable. So the food production per area, the yield is, is increasing massively. And that is, by the way, one um, massive save, it's, um, way of, of um, saving the environment. Right? It's, um, if, if we didn't increase yields in the way that it was possible, and that is also true for the, for the world as a whole, actually, um, that um, until the mid-20th century, food production was very much driven by an expansion of the area that was used for it, and then at some point, um, this decoupling happened and the area that was used for food production didn't increase. And now we probably reach the point um, of like kind of peak farmland um, from when on um, farmland will start to decrease probably in the world. Um, and then we come to income. It's probably hard to see, but it's kind of also the point. You see at the very bottom um, incomes for the UK, the US, Japan and the world average from the year 1000 to the year 1820. And you see that there is almost no trend. Like All of these lines are very flat. The incomes are expressed in, in modern dollars, so they are adjusted for price changes over time. Economic historians um, um, like to express it in 1990 dollars, uh, so it is what a dollar would buy you back in 1990. Um, 
and the income increase is very modest at best for a country like the UK, where it slowly starts uh, to increase um, after 1500. But then if we move forward and we see that... Oh, there's a... Do you also see that? Yeah. <laughs> um, then this is actually picking up, and then income in the UK uh, increases massively um, over the last 200 years, and the US um, starts a little bit later, but then quickly overtakes um, the UK and reaches even higher incomes. Um, and Japan um, picks up yet later, and um, the average of the world um, also increased massively over time. Um, so, but it's still an abstract measure. It's like difficult to compare over time what it actually means that um, a dollar bought you the same in, in 1800s as it, as it would um, buy you today. So to give a better understanding of um, what, what this increase in, in incomes actually means for your life and what economic growth means for your life, I want to look at the structure of um, um, expenditure back in... Um, in the late 17th century in the UK, for which we have uh, reasonably good data. We saw before that the income level is very low. In modern terms, the income here is, is uh, around 1,400 pounds per year per person. And this is how the average um, British person spent their money. Um, a huge share goes to food and, and drinks and tobacco, and then another big share goes to clothing and footwear, and by then, most of your income is already spent on these very basic products, and a little um, is left for, for things like education and health, um, or for uh, very little for recreation and entertainment. And if we want to compare that um, with today and see what the effect of income growth really was, then we actually have to rescale the, um, the graph um, to fit it on there. So you see again the same, so the same data um, um, on, the, on the left, and then the income in 2001 in comparison looks like that. Incomes increased from 1,400 um, to 20,000 um, pounds expressed in the same currency, and um, your expenditure in the UK looks like that. A much smaller share goes to food, but still the, the, um, the amount of money that you spend on food is, is, is much higher, as you see in this comparison. A much smaller share goes to, um, to drinks and tobacco, but again, it's, it is um, more that you can buy with the higher income. So the effect of increasing incomes is that you um, ha um, ha have increasing consumption possibilities. And you see that these categories that were very small before, like education and health, for example, or recreation and ent entertainment, they now make up a much larger part of um, the um, expenditure of the British. Um, why does that happen? That's the chapter that I call now Candles and Books to look at two um, very um, plastic examples of, of how this income increase actually happens because I think it's important to understand how incomes actually increase. And the question um, that I want to answer with this uh, visualization is how long do you have to work to afford one hour of reading life? So if you want to sit down in the evening actually spend one hour of reading, um, for, for those of you who have uh, traveled or so to a place where there's no light after the sun sets, you know how um, important it is actually to have, this, to have light after, after um, the sun sets. Um, and to have a comparison over time for the physics students, um, this is expressed in 1,200 lumen hours, which is roughly um, like having an 80 watts uh, light bulb burning for an hour. Back in 1800, you had candles to do the job and to give you reading light. And if you wanted to buy enough candles to um, get that much light, you had to work six hours. And I guess the nice, uh, I guess the nice thing about this light comparison is that it's something that is very comparable over time. If you compare incomes, then the, the, good, the bundle of goods that you can, uh, you can buy in, in um, 1800 is a very different bundle of goods, of course, um, that you can uh, buy today, like some goods are gone probably, like, I don't know, slavery or like, right, like some of these aspects are gone, some other goods um, um, came, uh, entered the, 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 um, the consumption bundle that people couldn't even think about in 1800 if you think about your phone or um, uh, having a flight to, to somewhere nice. Um, but with 
with light, you have this one metric that you can nicely compare over time. So let's move forward and let's uh, jump to 1880. Um, the technology changed and it's now the kerosene lamp that you can buy. And if you want to get the same uh, uh, hour of reading light, you have to work for 15 minutes only. So a massive reduction in working hours needed for, for the hour of reading light. And if you move forward to 1950 and you have the light bulbs and the amount of work that you have to actually put in is around eight seconds of your, of your work day. And if you move all the way to 1997, that's the, when this paper was published, um, then it's um, half a second that you have to put in. And that is basically the, the driver of income. The driver behind income growth is um, productivity growth, growth. And that's one example for this productivity growth. Growth as you switch from one technology to the other, um, you get more um, um, out of, your, of, of the work that you're putting in. Um, there is also newer data. It's not, not as nice because it doesn't show you the, um, the changing technologies, but there's also newer data on the cost of light over the last 700 years, and you see that it was actually starting to decrease in as early as the 14th uh, century. And the price came down now in pounds uh, for for one hour of reading, like from 40,000. Um, is it? Uh, yeah, it's also it's, a, it's it's like a hundred watt light bulb. So it came down from 40,000 all the way down to three pounds. And the the consequences of, consequence of this is that back in the um, um, back in the, 19th, in the 18th century or earlier, it was only a small elite that was actually rich enough to buy the amount of candles that um, could light up your house or uh, that could um, give you reading light at night. Um, and as prices come down, the um, income, the, the purchasing power of, of the masters is actually increasing. And you have to put in less hours of work. And this was very nicely put by Thoreau, who said, the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. I think that's a nice quote that, that um, puts it nicely. And to give one second example of productivity growth and why incomes grow, I want to look at book production. Um, back before the invention of the printing press, the way to copy a book, the only way to copy a book was to sit down and write the whole thing uh, with your hands. And scribes were doing this job, and the estimates that I found is that it took Ascribe um, 136 days to copy the Bible, which of course was the most copied uh, book, book at the time, which gives you a productivity of 0 0.007 books per day. If we move forward, and we see um, in 1440, uh, a guy very close to my hometown in Mainz, Johannes Gutenberg, came up with the idea to turn a wine press into a printing press. And um, with the printing press and movable types, it was um, now possible to produce two and a half books per day for one, um, for one worker. So that's like more than a 300-fold um, um, increase in productivity. And as we move along, um, the in Industrial Revolution kicks in, and the steam-powered printing in the early 19th century increases, increases it again tenfold, and you can produce 25 books per day. So this increase in incomes from 1688 to 2001 is due to the um, um, increase in productivity in all of the people um, that work in the economy. And then you can exchange, like you're the, 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 book, um, in the book production business and you're more productive than the other guys are in the, um, uh, in the textile industry and um, can make use of, of modern textile spinning and you can exchange the goods and your incomes increase um, thanks to these productivity increases. And a consequence of that is also that you have to put in less hours of work. So if we look at working hours over time, this is what is shown in this chart, then the estimates for the late 19th century, earliest data that I could find are that you had to work between 62 and 72 hours per week, uh, mostly no weekends, no holidays, um, people were falling in their beds, um, uh, tired in the evening and, and waking up to, to go to work again. And then that came down um, over the last years um, and is now between 33 and 40. You also see that the US puts um, in more working hours than the uh, European countries. You apparently don't uh, value leisure as much since you are richer. 
Um, and another um, consequence or another aspect of income is, the, is uh, shown in this chart. It might, be, it might look a bit confusing on the um, x-axis you see income in 2003 for um, countries around the world and on the y-axis you see the self-reported mean life satisfaction. So people are asked in service um, to report their life satisfaction and they give an answer and then you, you see the means given for each country and you see this strong correlation between um, income in the country and the self-reported life satisfaction. So it's actually something um, that seems to um, increase the um, life satisfaction around the world. Um, so the, the concept, like the immediate driver of income growth is productivity, but um, of course this productivity increase doesn't come from, from nowhere. And um, I want to quickly talk about the um, value of education. I want to get back to that at the very end. This is showing you literacy rates since um, the late 15th century. And in the late 15th century, it was only this tiny elite in these um, European um, countries um, that were able to, to read and write. In no country, it was higher than uh, 20%. And then um, with more books becoming available thanks to the invention also of the printing press in, in just before in 1440 and then it's um, slowly um, um, gains importance in Europe. Um, more people have, are having books available and more people are, um, are picking up books and literacy rates um, start to increase and really the masses are um, getting educated. And then it's really also the people, um, not from the, from the noble ranks often, but um, from the lower ranks that actually make the huge inventions that drive the um, productivity increase, the industrial revolution that we just looked at. But just a, a number of these key inventions. We looked at the productivity increase of the printing press. Similar um, advancements were made in iron making in the late 18th century. The spinning jenny I, uh, I mentioned, this is the, like the big industry in early industrialization. Um, what steam engine um, but then also the development of artificial um, fertilizers that we looked at in the increase of um, yields, um, improvements in transport, if you think about the canals and uh, canals in, in the UK, steamships that cross the oceans, railways that cross the US, and then later planes, but also inventions like, um, it, like the germ theory or penicillin are increasing basically the productivity of, um, of people in the health sectors, or like maybe like having any productivity at all for the first time. And this still continues. Like if you look at 2015, then these things like the Ebola vaccine that was now, uh, had now a um, successful trial or the, like one thing that I was excited about is to see these see-through solar panels, which um, um, makes it possible to have like skyscrapers turned into um, sources of energy. Uh, they continue to increase productivity. And to give a very uh, recent example, that is something that I just, saw the news today that apparently yesterday, it's from dated from 29th of September, um, they um, um, invented a new test that allows um, to, to, to test for all viruses and crucially, as they say in the headline, I highlighted it there, it makes it faster and far less expensive. And these inc improvements are what's driving income growth. Um, and now I want to take a very long-term perspective and see how incomes grew, not just in, in the UK that I was focusing on now, but around the world. This is 1800 life expectancy, as we saw before, and if we look at GDP per capita, and in 1820 we have the first kind of comparable data um, across the world. And we see in all of these dark red cut countries that income levels are very low, um, below $1,000 uh, in, in modern terms. In some countries, like the Western European countries and also the US, um, experienced some productivity increase, which resulted in income increases, and they were slightly better off, but still had incomes of less than $2,000. And if we um, look, take a different view on this, um, on this same data and look at the distribution of incomes back in 1820, then we find this. This is the income distribution in 1820. It's on the logarithmic x-axis, going all the way from $100 to $50,000 on the very right, but no, no one has these high incomes back then. And to, to give some meaning to this um, low income, you see that the mean is around $500 per year per person. Um, I plot against them the latest available data from 2010, 
um, in the same currency measure in the same data source. And you see that people were poorer than people in Madagascar today, and Madagascar is one of the very poorest countries of the world. Much poorer than people in Iraq for the majority of the world. Only a small elite was richer than the average Indian at the time. Um, Peru lies here, China um, at the very end of the distribution here, and Chile, Japan, and the US are off the chart for the income distribution in 1820. And I was mentioning before that these comparisons over time are difficult to make. One example I think that is telling is if you, um, like the Forbes always puts up these lists of the richest people in the world, and they also have one with historical people. The, the richest guy apparently is some general, like in, according to their estimates, is some general from the times of Caesar. And the second richest guy is um, Nathan Rothschild, who died in 1836. Um, and when he died, he was by far the richest person in, in the world, um, could afford anything that you could possibly um, consume back in, 18, uh, in the early 19th century. And he died of an abscess. And this abscess would be something that you could cure easily with um, some cheap antibiotics that you would get from the pharmacy today. So the richest person at this time, and by these Forbes estimates, the second richest person in all times, um, dies of something that each, every one of you can afford easily. So this, it shows how difficult these price comparisons or income comparisons really are, right? Like in the most important thing, you are all richer than the, the second richest guy in, in human history. Um, and if you think about the other aspects, like he's never been to a, to a cinema, he's never been on a plane, he's never listened to music on his iPhone. In a lot of aspects, he, um, he could not even dream of the... Um, yeah, um, things that you are all enjoying. Um, so let's move from 1820 forward, huge step forward to 1988, and we look at the global income distribution again. On the x-axis, we have um, the yearly income per person going from one dollar on the left to sixty thousand on the on the right. It's again a logarithmic scale, and if we look at the income distribution of the developed countries, then we see that the um, mean is just below $10,000 back in 1988. If we look at sub-Saharan Africa, if we add this to the picture, then we see that there's almost no overlap. overlap. So the richest people in sub-Saharan Africa are as poor are as, as the poorest people in the developed countries. We can add Soviet Russia and North, uh, North, Northern Africa uh, with very high income inequality, also Latin America and Caribbean spreading all the way from the very left of the chart to the very right with very high income inequality. Much of Asia is in poverty and India um, is poor and China is on top of that. Um, and each, each area in this chart um, corresponds to the size of the country in population terms so you can compare the actual distribution of all of the world citizens. And if we just look at the distribution then we see that the world is clearly divided. You have this majority of the world um, living, in, living in poverty and then um, apart from that, a much richer um, world on the right. If we add the poverty line, and the poverty line that is um, now in use by the World Bank is, is a very low poverty line of $1.25 per day, which adds up um, over 365 days to an income of $456. Everyone who, is, who has an income that is lower than that is considered to live in extreme poverty. And we see that this poverty line runs right through the um, um, uh, distribution here on the left and that large share of the world population is living in poverty. And now we can actually move forward and see how the world distribution changed. So first we see until 1993 that the world population is increasing, China and India are getting much higher. And then 1998, we see that the um, majority of the poor people are slowly moving to the right. Um, and this continues to 2008. And in 2011, we see how China overtook, how much of Asia actually grew, and how this income distribution, this bimodal income distribution of a poor world and a rich world, gave way to this unimodal income distribution um, where the inequality in the world um, is, is now much lower. At some point in the, in the 90s, um, this trend of increasing inequality that we've seen for um, more than two centuries before that is actually um, 
um, turning around and income inequality in the world as a whole is now falling. And if we just focus on the left-hand tail of this distribution, then we see what is happening to poverty. 1820, we had this income distribution with just one big hump on the left. Then we switched to this bimodal distribution in 1988 and in 2011 back to this unimodal income distribution. In 1820, it is difficult, as I was saying, um, to compare income levels, but the best estimates of, um, of the economists that study this are that around 94% of the world population was living in extreme poverty and only a small elite was slightly better off. Um, as we move from 1820 to 1988, we see that some countries that uh, we saw earlier in blue um, had huge income increases, so the poverty share must fall. And if we look at the data, then we see that in 1970, around 60% of the world population um, are living um, with less, um, are living in extreme poverty. For 1988, we now have better data, and we can look at the income distribution, how it splits up um, to the left of the 456 dollar line, we see that 36% of the world are living in extreme poverty. We can add this to the chart here. And if we go to 2011 um, and split up the distribution again, then we see that the distribution has moved to the right and the share of people living in extreme poverty has fallen to 14%. If we put all of the data together, then we see this long uh, decline of um, people living in extreme poverty over the last 200 years. And as I was showing earlier, like the perception of people is apparently that this trend is exactly the opposite, that people are actually thinking that the share of people living in poverty is doubling. So just a different view on this, the share of people living in, in poverty comes down, and that of course means that the share of people not living in poverty was increasing over all of these years of these two um, centuries. We can also look at this in absolute numbers. It shows you the massive increase in the world population from barely more than one billion back in 1820 to now more than seven billion. And we see that um, while the share of people in living in extreme poverty was falling, we see that the absolute number of people in extreme poverty was actually increasing until some point in the um, 1970s or so. And now we um, have falling extreme poverty, and extreme poverty is back to a billion now, 14%, as we saw earlier. The World Bank also now has some estimates for uh, 2015, um, where they estimate that it's um, now 12%. Um, from this, like this productivity and income um, story, I think is is one very crucial story, but it's not everything, and you ask, like, money is just like a, it's not, a, it's not an end in itself, but just a means. So let's look at um, the living conditions that, um, the other living conditions that we care about. We had life expectancy in 1800. Um, oh, there's something missing, huh? Oh, no. Um, and a different way of looking at the distribution of life expectancy in 1800 is shown on this chart. It's a bit of an unusual chart, so let's explain it. On the x-axis, you see the cumulative share of the world population. And on the y-axis, you see the life expectancy. And then I ordered all of the countries for which we have estimates for the life expectancy, going all the way from the countries with the lowest life expectancy on the very left to the countries with the highest life expectancy on the very right. And we see that the countries with the lowest life expectancy, like India or South Korea, have just a um, life expectancy of 25 years. And all of the countries are, of course, in the data that is underlying this chart, but they're not shown as it would be too many layers there. And the countries on the very right, like Belgium and the Netherlands, they um, just have below 40 years of life expectancy back then. And then we can see how the world changed now, not in terms of income, but in terms of uh, the distribution of, of health. And until 1950, we saw this massive increase in life expectancy in the richest countries. Norway, the US, Canada, Germany, all have a life expectancy of um, above or just below 70 years. And then really apart from that are the countries like China, India, um, with um, much lower life expectancy and they barely made any um, progress in these 150 years where the richer part of the world made this massive progress. And the world has changed again and over the last um, six decades the picture has changed to that. We see now that the countries that had the lowest life expectancy back in 1950 made the um, biggest progress and fastest progress and actually improved their life expectancy 
uh, to now over 60 and 70 years. India um, in the mid 60s, country like China has now a much higher life expectancy like uh, than the countries uh, than the rest of countries had in 1950. But it's also true that the life expectancy in some, um, especially in African countries, are still in the 50s or 60s. But you see that the world, um, if you look at the distribution and the growth, then we come from a world with very high equality, but a very low level of, of health. And we um, move to a world with very high inequality, where some countries were much better off than others. And now we're back to a world with higher equality, but on a much higher level than back in 1800. Um, and this shows you the strong relation of the two aspects that we discussed before. On the x-axis, you see GDP per capita, and then on the y-axis, I plot the life expectancy of each of these countries. And you see the, 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 the strong correlation between the two, um, and you also see that um, in each of these different colors, in green and blue and red and uh, purple, I plot the data for different years, and at each um, income level, at each given income level, you can now buy more life expectancy. And that is one part of this price story that we talked about before, also this price story in, um, in health, right? As the price for vaccinations come down, comes down, um, you can afford more health um, for the same income level than before. And which means that this um, uh, return to equality in health is, is actually much stronger than in, um, in terms of incomes. We said before, for that it's mostly due to changes at the um, mortality patterns at a young age, but to think that it would only be due to mortality patterns at a young age would be wrong. This blue line shows you life expectancy at birth, and then in the, in the lines above, you see the life expectancy of a one-year-old, a five-year-old, a ten-year-old, and it actually goes up for, for all of the different age groups. It, it goes up mostly for the, for the life expectancy at birth, because um, the mortality is changing most dramatically at a young age, but it also goes up for the life expectancy of a 30-year-old, if you want, like the, I guess that's probably like more 20-year-old uh, Um So uh, the life expectancy of a 30-year-old was 63 back in 1845, and then it increased to 82 today. So it's like mortality patterns that change across the whole age distribution. To focus on the um, on the bottom end. And to look, at the, um, to look at child mortality over the long run, I have like a similar chart as the one that we just saw for life expectancy for child mortality. And this is now the world population back in 1800, ordered from left to right by decreasing child mortality. Some countries, these are estimates, and I guess um, come with uh, considerable uncertainty, but in some countries, the child, po child mortality is um, high, like in most countries, it's actually higher than um, 40%. Some countries as high as 50% so that every second child dies before it reaches its fifth birthday. And then if we move to 1950, we see the same picture again of a world clearly divided in a richer part and a poorer part um, with, with much higher child mortality. And if we move all the way down to 2013, then we see there was this catch up now of the countries like India or China that reduced their child mortality massively over the last six decades. Um, and the global average, if you want to look at the figures, is um, went down from 43% to 20% in 1950, and now all the way to 3.4%. But it's also true here that uh, some countries are, um, are still experiencing very high child mortality, something that I guess the effective altruism uh, movement is trying to change also. Um, like now, it was mostly a very um, positive story of, of long-term um, progress. Um, but I don't want to, like I think it would be wrong to think that there is some kind of automatism to it and um, it is actually something um, that can go wrong and we, should, we have to care about um, how, how we manage this, um, this progress over time. And I want to look at some of my own research quickly which looks at the distributions of incomes. It's a bit of a complicated chart, but I will like, show it step by step, so I hope it uh, makes sense at the end. Here on the x-axis, we see the real income of the poorest 10% of the country. And on the y-axis, we see 
the real income of the richest 10%. And if we look at France in 2010, then we see that um, the richest 10% earned 45,000 um, dollars and the poorest 10% earned 12,500 dollars. So the income of the richest was 3.57 times higher than the incomes of the poorest. So the income ratio is 3.57. And if we plot this line, um, then we see that all of the values that lie on this line have an income ratio of 3.57. So if we move France up and down, then the income inequality measured as this income ratio um, stays constant. And now we can see the change over, over time for France. And if we plot France in this um, chart, then we see that from 1978 to 84, there was actually a recession, and then incomes um, started to increase again in France. And since 1989, France grew, um, like the income in France at the bottom and at the top of the distribution grew um, equally fast, so that the income ratio between the poorest and the richest in France um, did not change. Um, now, if France would move to the right and downwards, then the country would get more equal. We would move to an income ratio of 3 to 1 or 2 to 1. And if France would move up, then the country would get more unequal. And we can plot all of the income ratios in this chart and now have the income ratio 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, and 6 to 1, and can see what happened in other countries. Here's Norway. And Norway has this massive... Um, um, growth over the last three decades and a much lower income ratio, an income ratio actually lower than um, 3 to 1 in this country and barely any change in, in the income ratio. It's pretty much parallel to, um, to, the, to these ISO curves. And this is what happened in the US. We see that the US um, back in 1979, the poorest 10% in the US in 1979 didn't really experience any income growth until 2013. Like it stayed exactly on the same position on the x-axis, so maybe a tiny um, slight, slight bit to the right. And income growth to the, um, the richest 10% was actually quite strong. And if we look at the income ratios, we see that the income ratio back in 1979 was around 4.5 four and to 1, and then it crossed the 5 to 1 income ratio and is now getting closer to a 6 to 1 income ratio in the US. And to finish this, um, a different story, here's the UK from 1979 to 1991, the same as what's happening in the, in the US. Incomes only for the richest 10% increase, and the poorest state um, equally poor. Um, but since then, it had, has changed um, quite a bit, and income growth was very strong and lifted both the rich and the top, uh, the rich and the bottom up. I guess that's that's also, like that's. I just wanted to show that as a reminder that there is no um, like we can't just extra like we can't just sit back and, and let things happen. We have to actually care about the things that we want to see in the world. Um, a quick outlook to um, see what is happening in the future. There's of course very difficult to to predict, and this comes with some uncertainty. But I guess it, it is interesting to see. Um, this is the, the latest data that we looked at before. Global poverty, um, the share of people living with less than $1.25 from 1981 to 2011. It came down from 43% to 14%. And this was one of them, uh, what was the, actually the first Millennium Development Goals that now come to an end in 2015 to half the share of the world living in extreme poverty from 1990 onwards, when it was 36%, and that was... I think the most important um, Millennium Development Goal and actually one that was um, met. Um, now, one way of, of asking what we can expect until 2030 is to extrapolate what we saw in the past. And until 2030, the new goal, the Sustainable Development Goal number one that was just announced um, last week, um, is to eradicate extreme poverty um, completely. And if we look back to the, to the last 10 years and take the growth rate of incomes in each country of the world and project that forward, what we actually see is that, in, um, that global poverty um, will be just below 5% in 2030. So while this trend towards um, lower poverty continues and 
we're clearly on the right track, it would actually be too low to, um, to decrease poverty or to eradicate poverty completely until 2030 if we're just continuing on the very good trajectory that we already are. So I guess one more motivation for effective altruism. Um, and to show one, one country, one continent that actually is now changing um, quite dramatically, this is showing you growth rates from 1996 to 2013. In, in the mid-90s, like, like Africa was, was of course a continent where income growth um, wasn't as steady, um, to say the least, as, as in much of Europe or uh, much of the other parts of the world. But in, since 1960, we see, we see very strong growth in many countries actually throughout the whole African continent. And if you look at the GDP per capita growth rates, then in many countries it's five, five, four, five, six, seven, sometimes even higher than 8% per year. Um, so things are moving forward, but they actually have to speed up to, to meet this goal of, ext of eradicating extreme poverty. There might be some reasons why we can be more optimistic than just extrapolating um, the trend that we saw before, and that is what I want to end with. Um, we saw at the very beginning how important education is, both for... Um, coming up with the innovations that actually increase productivity and increase um, incomes and also for making use of these productivities, right? Like all of the technologies that we saw from the scribe that writes down the Bible by hand all the way to making use of the um, medical innovations that we looked at. We saw how important um, education is. And we can project education um, probably more easier than, than most other measures because we can just um, assume that the person who is um, educated today, and in this case literate today, will be literate tomorrow, and um, we can see how the population breakdown by age group um, moves forward and, and have an idea of what the future um, education of the world will look like. Now, looking at this world map, this shows you the literacy rate of the, uh, of the 65 year and older, and we see that in many countries, in Africa, literacy rates are very low, below 40%, but sometimes below 20%. That is also true for the Middle East. It's true for South Asia and also in East Asia and, um, and, and South America. Literacy rates are not very high and are still uh, below 80%. Now let's move the, um, the focus to the young generation and see who's, who will be in charge in, um, in 2030. This is, the break, this is the age group of the 15 to 24 year olds, and again we see how dramatically the world changed. The literacy rates in, in South America and East Asia are now um, well above 90%, and much of Africa made progress, especially if you look at the north of Africa and also the Middle East. I think that's some underreported story of how dramatic the in, um, increase in, in um, literacy and education was there. Uh, we talked about it earlier today, how important um, education is um, for democratization. I think that it should also make us um, optimistic that um, we can expect um, um, machine change in, in this region uh, where it's so much needed. Um, and that is, of course, also one contributing um, factor to um, achieving economic growth. Um, so I think that was my big overview of how living conditions changed over the long run. I wanted to um, quickly show what this website looks like. Um, it's called Our World in Data. This is the starting page. And then I go through each of these aspects, um, like child mortality or um, global poverty or famines or malnutrition, and um, write articles about each of these topics that break down in four parts. The first part looks at the long-run perspective of a particular indicator, like the long-run um, perspective on child mortality, for example. The second part then um, reviews the, um, the empirical literature and tries to understand um, what drives uh, this decline in child mortality and what are the consequences of this decline of child mortality, for example, for the changing age structure of the population. Um, a third part um, it's something that we discussed in the meeting before that I think we should put way more emphasis on, um, on, um, on the quality of data that we use in, in social science research and the third part of each um, entry discusses the quality of the, of the measures that are discussed. 
And the fourth um, and last part of each um, entry lists the data sources th so that if you're interested in one particular aspect, then you can go there and find out um, where you would find the data and, and make use of that data and explore it yourself. Um, it's also a part of this productivity increase story. Like if we go back to the scribes and see this increase, then um, the internet um, gets you off the chart somewhere there with um, productivity increases. And I think it's also a bit I can, um, like, I, I'm, I'm not very happy in the, about the way that we are, we are now presenting research. Like, we're basically making the use of the same technology that was available to, to the Gutenberg back home in Mainz in 1440. Like, we are, I mean, we're like putting stuff on the web, but then mostly they are still, um, like, pieces of paper that are just displayed in a PDF document on, on the web. So I think it's also an effort of, of making use of the technologies that the, um, the internet um, gives you. I think we loaded some of the um, websites from before. So to give you an idea of what it actually looked like, this is the view, uh, this is the article on democratization. It has this empirical view in the beginning, and then these charts, this chart, for example, is like a very often used one that shows you the number of democracies the quality and the definition of a democracy is also discussed there. And it shows you the number of democracies over time. And you can add, for example, the number of autocracies. And you see this um, massive reversal there in, after the breakdown of the Soviet Union when the number of democracies um, soared and the number of autocracies fell. You can actually also see which countries are um, uh, called a democracy in this measure. This is the, the world in 1985. If we want to look at the same transition to 1995, then we see um, which dramatic consequences the breakdown of the Soviet Union had for democracy around the world. Um, but it, this, is, this is one that I like. This is basically the same data that we looked at before with the number of democracies over time, but taking into account the distribution of different population sizes across these uh, democracies. So it's looking at the number of people under different regimes. And in green, you see the number of people that live in democracies, and in red, the number of people that live in autocracies. And the internet, of course, allows you to explore this data um, in more detail. If you're not interested in the countries where we have no data, you can get rid of that. If you're not interested in the absolute number of people over time, but you want to look at the share of people in each regime, then you can change the view into that, and you see how the share of people in different regimes changed. Um, and of course, you can always um, download this. You can also download um, all the data that underlies it so that you can explore it in, uh, yourself with, uh, in more detail. And then we get to the correlates and consequences section, where if we saw, see, for example, this um, uh, strong correlation between education in the past, that is showing you the mean years of schooling for each country back in 1970. And this is the democracy score, the latest available data from 2013. And we see that the countries that were better educated in 1970 are more likely to be a democracy now. Um, and like from, from my Twitter account, I know that everyone is always screaming, correlation doesn't imply causation. So I don't have a good way of showing this um, in, a, in, a, in a chart. We discussed that also before, but on the website, then I'm uh, linking it to the relevant literature that studies um, the drivers of democracy in more detail. Um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to talk about <laughs> tonight.
scientists in that sense as a as a way of as a way of economic growth. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah I think I think that's very true. I think it's one of the drivers that are under um, that are supporting this um, increasing number of innovations that happened later, where people are having books to exchange ideas and to, to learn from each other, and, and one aspect of that is also um, translating and like br bridging these um, different languages and different cultural um, um, cycles. Very crucial one. Like, like this was where I'm emphasizing this section on data quality. That I think it is very crucial that we have uh, like this um, understanding of where data is coming from and how powerful um, data can be manipulated. But I also think that there is um, um, a, like a very strong um, research group looking at each of these different aspects and actually kind of um, <coughs> making sure, or like surveying that um, the the, the, um, the construction of these data sets and not all of the data that I was using um, in this presentation or on the website are necessarily from governments. Some of it's from governments, but others is from researchers and there are researchers that checking um, that governments don't don't make up data like in, in more economics terms. I think one um, like one well known is the inflation numbers for for some countries, right? Like Argentina or so that's where the where the government just invents numbers. Um, but then um, there are researchers that try to find ways of measuring the true inflation and these are the things that I would then discuss in this data quality section. And for the crime and violence rates, I think one aspect that you are emphasizing in, in your book is that you would look at, you would try to look at something um, where the definitions don't change over time and that is not um, subjective to non-reporting or reporting and I guess the consensus is that homicide is a very good measure um, for tracking that over time, because there's firstly no, uh, this, like, there can't be any um, <laughs> um, definitional um, quarrels about whether this person is actually dead or not. And the second thing is that there's um, probably less underreporting than for other crimes that you mentioned. Um, yep. So I have a question. Um, it's more of a technical question because I have this uh, theory that, for instance, like the enormous accumulation of wealth that we see now, basically, like. Like, uh, directly correlated to life expectancy and basically people giving like money from one generation to the next and just simply have more time in their life to basically like, give money to the next generation <laughs> to accumulate more wealth. The trouble with the side I have is that there is no way of actually accessing the data through like some sort of like uh, uh, like whatever computational interface. So like you have to download and then like basically do it's very, very complicated. So like a JSON interface or some sort of XML thing or whatever would be really appreciated because <laughs> it's good data. But it's yeah. very hard to access. So I'm thinking of productivity. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be great. Like, I mean, yeah. that's something that I would try to to get at. Like we we getting that slowly. Like now yeah. the data was previously stored just in simple CSVs that were then pulled into the visualization, right. and now we moved it to a SQL database and to have like an API at some point that actually it's allows you. Like <laughs> <laughs> but it would be it would be very good. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very optimistic view of the world. It's uh, quite encouraging. Um, you, you see all these data points where things are trending for the better, things that you might think uh, were not. 
On the other hand, you could have had someone as learned as you up here talking with, with the environment and pointing to uh, the increase in greenhouse gases and acidification of the ocean and a bunch of other data points that would make you think, oh, we're doomed. I wonder if you have any thoughts on how your research might fit with uh, uh, right. that kind of I mean, like now I wasn't able to present everything that is on this website, but um, environmental aspects and, and also climate change um, acidification of the ocean is not yet. They are all part of the, um, the website already, so that if, you, if you're interested in these kind of trends, then you can go and, and find how uh, global temperature is increasing. You find data on oil spills, you find data on air pollution, you find data on deforestation and reforestation. So environmental change is also one of the um, aspects that are covered. I, I, like the aim is really to cover every aspect that matters for our living conditions and environmental changes are of course very crucial for that. So it's, it's, it's part of it, it's just not part of the presentation now. And, and I would agree that I'm, I'm not very optimistic about some of these aspects, right? It's, it's not that I'm a crazy optimist, but just think that everything is getting better. I think that climate change is really uh, something that we should, we should uh, like we, we, yeah, we have to do much more about that um, if we don't want to run into trouble there. Right. Um, yeah.
perception versus reality lies and what implications that has for how we might shift our priorities in, in work and research in tackling these problems? Huh. Uh, I think, like, when I was looking at this misperception at the beginning, I think that's, like, hard, it's hard to find a field where the perception is actually right. So, in a lot of these fields, it's um, a lot of misperception. I, I, I was very surprised when I first read uh, Stephen Pinker's book, I didn't know that violence was decreasing. Um, and I think generally one um, thing when, you, when it's about like redirecting your focus to something else, then a lot of um, the effort that I'm putting in is also to get away from this fixation on events that make the headlines and um, that the news are full of. Because I think that's also like related to what the people at Effective Altruism are doing. If we look at these events, then there is some great response to, um, to the events, like an earthquake or so. Um, but we're missing out on a lot of these long-term things that are happening in the background. And then I guess it's the same for like decreasing child mortality as it is for, um, for climate change, right? Like it's actually, like the climate change people have exactly the same problem that the, that the development people have. That it's some slow process that happens over decades or centuries or so that never really have the reason to make the headlines. And um, um, in that case, it's a negative um, trend. In, 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 the, in my presentation, it's mostly positive trends. Um, and to get away from this event focus to these long term trends, I think, is important. Like one thing, if I would have to pick one, is for example, indoor air pollution, right? It's this thing that no one cares about, um, but because of the use of solid fuels in, um, in, in homes and um, in poorer households. Um, you have this problem of indoor air pollution, and especially women and children that um, are staying in the house um, are, are then dying of diseases caused by indoor air pollution. That is never making the headlines, it's not like you, you open the New York Times and if that's it, it tells you another, like, it's not this, right? Like, these things have never any event uh, reason to report them. But it's actually something that kills a lot of people and that could easily be fixed. I don't know how much time you have. Uh, like, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, well, maybe let's conclude on a more positive note. So, uh, one, one last question. <laughs> make it optimistic, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, hope this improved your mood in this weather. And please don't forget to fill in uh, the feedback forms. We'll collect them at the exit. Thank you very much and hope to see you at future events.